give it a few more moments and then we'll get started. Well, welcome everyone. If you're here, you're here for the Senate Bill 1537, Section 16 webinar, which intends to provide you a summary of the project work that DLCD, the, the Department of Land Conservation and Development, is underway with uh, regarding infrastructure considerations. Uh, I'm here today. My name is Madeline Phillips. I'm the public facilities planner for the Department of Land Conservation and Development, and I'm joined by my colleague, Palmer Mason, interagency coordinator, and our support staff, Ingrid Caudell. Thank you to both of you for joining us, and thanks to folks who are joining us today. The intent of this, this webinar is to overview the work related to infrastructure considerations uh, directed by Senate Bill 1537 in the 2024 legislative session. Um, we'll move through some slides, first starting with, um, with a project overview and focus on some of the key elements of the project. And upon conclusion of that, we will move into questions. Um, the way the webinar is structured, if you have questions to share with us, please do so uh, by inc including those in the queue using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen um, at the conclusion of our summary presentation. From here, I'll hand it over to my colleague Palmer to get us started in providing an overview of the project related to Senate Bill 1537, Section 16. Thanks, Palmer. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for um, being here with us. Um, I'm going to give the project overview here. Um, and uh, I'll start by saying that um, this, this project is one where um, DLCD is simply bringing a recommendation to the legislature. Um, what happens with the uh, report and the deliverable will be ultimately up to the legislature. Um, what we're hoping to accomplish um, with this project is to bring to the legislature a set of considerations, metrics, a process that they could use to evaluate um, requests from local governments for infrastructure that supports housing. Um, the we'll be looking at really uh, three things when we take this project on, we'll be looking at how do we evaluate project feasibility, viability, um, how to look at uh, project readiness, and how to look at intended outcomes. Um, you know, right now, the legislature doesn't have tools to help them look at project viability, development readiness, and intended outcomes. And the point of this project is to bring together a framework that will allow them to do that. You'll see that, um, we have uh, not a lot of time to do this project. Um, we're required to deliver this report to the legislature by December 31st of this year. And um, that's not a lot of time in which to have the conversation. Um, speaking of, to the conversation, one, what are, well, let's uh, move on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, apologies, go back to the, the, the previous slide, my, my apologies. So let me talk a little bit about the process going uh, forward here. Um, we're gonna be uh, looking at um, bringing together some focus groups. Um, we wanna have um, a conversation with you all um, to get your impressions, your ideas, your, your considerations that will feed into this project. Um, 
And if you're interested, let us know about joining one of those focus groups. We'll probably organize some focus groups along some, some different lines, along bringing the local governments together, the development community, the environmental community, housing advocates, and community-based organizations. Um, that input will be important as we work with our consultants to develop a draft framework. Um, that, um, oh, I, I apologize, I think I've, I've jumped ahead to the, the process. Thanks, uh, Maddie, for, for shifting here. Um, the, the focus groups are again intended to try to get the information from you all as communities and interested parties. The uh, other thing that we've done is we've put together a work group of agency partners who are helping us with this project. That's the interagency infrastructure work group that you see here. Um, Peggy, I think what we're doing is um, we'll be taking questions uh, at the end if that's, a, if that's okay. Um, so um, back to the work group. The work group is um, being put together with the agencies that that finance infrastructure projects, that review them for design and construction, um, and also for um, regulatory review for various permitting requirements. And our goal with engaging the work group is to um, <clears throat> understand from them what are the type of considerations, criteria, um, best practices that they use in reviewing infrastructure projects for the same things that I was talking about earlier project viability, development readiness, and, and outcomes. Um, and that will also inform this draft framework. Um, once we have the draft framework, then we will be going out for um, more uh, public comment. Um, and that public comment will be um, used to help us um, inform the ultimate product here. And you see on this timeline, we start with uh, this introductory webinar, kicking off the project. Um, we will go to the, the focus groups, getting uh, some initial input and uh, thoughts about what could go into a draft framework. We take the draft framework out um, later in November for public comment. Um, and that public comment will then uh, help us refine the draft framework and then deliver it to the legislature by the date here of December uh, 31st at the end of the year. Um, that's a very quick flyover of the, the, the projects. Uh, I do see several raised hands. Um, I'm wondering, Maddie, if we should try to take these questions now or let you uh, proceed with your slides first. Um, I'd ask the, the audience to hold questions just till we complete a little bit more explanation of the, the framework and some of the details related to it. Thanks very much for joining us and for having those questions. We will get to them shortly. Um, I'm just going to rewind back a few slides um, to, to talk a little bit about the structure of the project viability, development readiness, and intended outcomes components of, of the uh, proposed framework. Again, this is related to legislative appropriations for infrastructure funding pro projects. And we know that the variety of projects that um, come before the legislature are often of different sizes, scales, and types, and it's quite difficult to, um, to compare them and to determine whether or not they have uh, the, what it takes to, one, be, be constructible, and then two, be accomplishable in the, in the timeline um, that, that the legislature It looks like we may have lost Maddie here. Um, and we'll see if she can uh, join us again. Oh, there you are, Maddie. You're back. Thank you. Apologies, all. Um, we've we've come to a, a structure and framework for uh, for this framework related to different stages of considerations. The first stage is related to viability and asking the question: Is the project feasible? Is the project ready, i.e., can it be built in the immediate timeline? And thirdly, what are its outcomes? And do the, those outcomes meet basic policy priorities related, in this context, related to housing? Um, there are other considerations related to 
uh, resilience and environmental concerns, among other ca characteristics and policy objectives that many agencies and, and organizations are interested in that we'd like to include in those outcomes uh, for legislative consideration. But this would be, does the project qualify for consideration at this stage one level? The second stage, however, is a little bit more detailed. And, and we imagine that this stage is much more difficult and will require a lot more energy and time to really flesh out. And what we're proposing out of the, the deliverable that we will provide to the legislature in December is that we really focus on stage one considerations. Stage two considerations are thinking a little bit more deeply about how projects compare to one another, particularly when measuring potential outcomes and the production of in this case, the production of housing units and impact. And then secondly, when considering resilience, environmental protections, compliance, among other characteristics that projects often have. That stage one is, is it is it a, a project that's prepared and ready to go? And stage two is of those projects that are prepared and ready to go, how might we compare them to one another based on their merits? Um, I hope that that provides a little bit more clarity as to how we have intended in organizing the, the framework that is directed to us by the legislature and that what Palmer shared earlier about um, working through the process that you'll have an opportunity to join us if you're interested um, in providing, we'll, we'll follow up this webinar with, um, with a, some contact information and also with an opportunity for you, you to opt in, to add yourself to a list if you choose, um, so that we might have the opportunity to contact you if we're able to, to organize focus groups and include you in one of those focus groups. From that point, um, we've already covered the, the work that in the timeline of around our final deliverable, you'll have to, we'll, we'll beseech your, um, you to at least, understand our timeline is quite short and our ability to contact everyone and have everyone participate in one of those focus groups might be limited. However, your ability to provide public comment is, is quite open and we hope to have a draft by mid-December um, out for public review. And one way we can include you in that, uh, in that process if you're not able to join us for, a web, for one of the focus groups is that will share that information, the, the release of the public draft, along with uh, this recording of this webinar um, out to the group that has registered for the webinar. So thanks for opting in to at least contact for the draft review distribution um, and hopefully for your comments related to how our final deliverable takes shape. Our contact information is, is here and we'll provide it uh, along with a follow-up email to this webinar. Um, but I'm Madeline Phillips and Palmer Mason has just joined us, joined me as well. And I think at this point, we will open it up for questions. So folks that are, are watching the webinar, these are questions from the audience and you may or may not have um, the opportunity to review them at a future date. In, in watching this recording. Thank you. All right, we can open it up for questions now with the Q&A function, and I see that there are two. Uh, Peggy may have had her hand up first, I oh, think. Oh, great. Yeah. Are you able to come off mute, Peggy? Yeah, sorry, I really didn't. I, I, you froze. <clears throat> Excuse me, Palmer. You froze, and I discovered it was evidently my internet and not yours. So I don't have a, I don't have another question right okay. now. Great, great. Okay, Peggy, I appreciate it. Um, we have a question from Michael Grimm. To which legislative committee will the final report recommendation be delivered at the end of twenty four? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, I think we'll be submitting this um, report and the, the framework or matrix that we'll use or recommend to the legislature they consider for evaluating um, direct appropriations. We'll 
uh, likely go to the two housing committees. So this is in the House and in the Senate. And then um, one of the appropriations committees, one of the subcommittees in the legislature will probably ask for some guidance from the legislature on, on where to send that. Um, there's really a couple different options that could go to either to natural resources or uh, to transportation, economic development, uh, general government. So we're not sure which one, um, but uh, you know, it will be going to both the policy and appropriation committees. Great, thank you, Palmer. Uh, we have a question. Can you tell us which agencies you're coordinating with? I can tell you, Damien. Um, Oregon Housing and Community Services, uh, uh, Business Oregon, Oregon Department of Transportation, Oregon Health Authority, and or the Public Health Administration that works with Oregon Health Authority related to drinking water, Department of Environmental Quality, Department of State Lands, Department of Building Services, uh, Consumer and Bu Building Services, um, and the Oregon State Fire Marshal are part of the interagency uh, work group that we've compiled. One more question. As I understand it, there have been some challenges with the first round of administration of these infrastructure appropriations by Business Oregon pertaining to timing and prevailing wage. Will the work groups also have the ability to address topics like these? Uh, I'm I'm happy to try to answer that, um, Maddie. Uh, that is not a question that this project will be focused on. We're not um, re making any recommendations to the legislature about how infrastructure projects should be uh, funded, how um, they should be structured or scaled, or um, you know the contractors, workers are paid, or anything like that. That's not really our task. Uh, our task is to help the legislature look at the list of projects that comes in and help them decide, as Maddie pointed out, particularly in stage one, are the projects ready um, from a, the point of view of being feasible and viable? Um, and with uh, are they ready within a certain period of time? And are they likely to achieve an outcome? So in this case, uh, in particular, a certain number of residential you, uh, residential units and types of units. Um, we do want to consider, as Maddie pointed out, as, um, in the project, other uh, important public policy goals, like how the project might consider climate resiliency, equity, things like that as well. Um, but we're not we're not really tasked with getting into how projects happen, um, just whether they are really ready. Uh, to contribute to um, our housing challenge and and um, and do so within a particular time. And the, the amount of time that might be that def defines development readiness is really a legislative question. We'll probably have some recommendations based on um, what the legislature typically looks at, um, but um, that will ultimately be a legislative call. Great. Uh, Scott, why don't you come off mute and ask your question? Scott Norquist, I see your hand up. Nope. Uh, another related question. Um, what is an immediate timeline for your report? Yeah, our, well, I, I can answer that. Sorry, Maddie, if you were about to um, uh, answer that. So we do, we have a defined timeline. So the legislature has set out that the report is due as of December 31st. Um, we expect that we probably will turn it in, as it were, a little early. Um, and we will have um, maybe not an absolute final product and report by the time we get to December legislative days, which are uh, December 10th to 12th, um, but we expect to be near completion of the projects. Um, and there has been some conversation with the legislature about presenting to one or more legislative committees during that time, but that's not final. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little sense of um, where we will be as we you know near that project date of December 31st of this year. 
Thanks, Palmer. I think Peggy's question was, that's very informational. I think Peggy's question was focused more on the immediate timeline of the projects themselves. What we know, Peggy, is that, um, is that projects that come before the legislature for direct appropriations are usually, um, well, there's usually really a hope that they happen within a fairly uh by by infrastructure standards fairly quick timeline uh most infrastructure projects in in my limited experience are something like a three to five year timeline um, from design to construction and the hope is that projects that come before the legislature are able to achieve outcomes in uh in a relatively short cycle what we don't know necessarily we, we know that there are often continuing resolutions um, for project appropriations, but there isn't a lot of certainty around that. So the likelihood that the, the funds will aim to be distributed within the biennium, um, but there likely is not an expectation that those projects would be completed um, necessarily by the conclusion of that biennium. And, and that's something that is typically handled by Business Oregon under their infrastructure finance authority function. Um, so we're not we're not certain there's no hard timeline as to when the projects need to be delivered um, but there is a good likelihood that folks um the, the the legislators themselves will be looking very closely at the ability of a project to to catalyze in a, a legislative cycle let's say um so i hope that helps answer a little bit of the question but it doesn't it isn't of course certain um I might turn to Damien Cernick. You've asked a few questions and I wonder if you'd come off mute and just share those questions because I think we've got a couple streaming in now that are getting a little disjointed. I want to make sure you have an opportunity to ask a couple different ones. All right, thanks, Maddie. Can you hear me okay? Yep. So I just wanted to confirm that the, the infrastructure projects that are going to be focused on with this work are those that would be immediately associated with a housing development project. And these could be like sewer line work, frontage improvements, things like that. Or would this also examine projects that might be in a CIP that would serve maybe a larger area of the city where construction of this project would um, then support the development of housing sooner rather than later? And then my last question really is just about the final report and, and whether it'll be available at DLCD's website uh, once it's submitted to the legislature. Thank you. Absolutely, Damien. Uh, I'll answer your last question first because it's easiest. Um, the, the report will be available um, in December. Well, first of all, we, we'll publish a final report when we deliver it to the legislature and it will be available on DLCD's website, absolutely. Um, as to the question about uh, uh, whether certain projects qualify or what what scale of projects we're considering in this this um, infrastructure considerations evaluation matrix, it really varies. Um, there are some projects that may, uh, for example, may be very large in scale on a capital improvement program list, such as an upgrade to a facility um, that serves an, a whole community, and those projects. Um, might need an additional amount of funding to complete uh, or, or come online. And, and those projects, as you, as you all might understand, are very difficult to compare in scale and impact to a project like you just described, Damien, of um, a project that serves a particular housing development with a set number of units that it will produce or, or catalyze. And our, our challenge is to provide at least an understanding of the likelihood and viability of a project, and then provide a structure for legislators to consider the different scales and sizes and types of projects. What we don't necessarily have a uh, direction to do is limit which projects are, are applicable or which projects are, are eligible for consideration um, because the, the field is open in this context um, to legislators and, and their interests. Um, what we hope is that there are projects of uh, that are that are that come before the legislature that do have me measurable impact and that that impact can be um, 
can be quantified or can can be shared in a way that's constructive to compare projects to one another. Um, whether we're able to accomplish the that that second stage, so stage one being it's a viable project, and stage two being it, it has merits uh, that can be enumerated, um, that will be up to the legislature to to consider and and quantify. And there's there's also a, a fairly decent chance that some of the considerations we suggest to the legislature may not be used. Um, so we'll we'll do our best to construct something that's simple and easily accessible, but we may not we may not hit the the sweet the sweet spot or the perfect mark in terms of what is um, what's on the mind of the Oregon legislature in the twenty twenty five session and beyond. Hopefully that helps answer your questions a little bit, Damian. Um, why don't we go to Sarah? You have your hand up. Hi, thanks. Um, just circling back on the issue of the timing. Um, so with SB 1537, it's general fund, and I assume that moving forward, it would be general fund, so needs to be spent within the biennium. And the the way that Business Oregon has structured the, the funding, it's um, reimbursement based on eligible invoices. So you do need to have completed the eligible work in order to have the funds allocated before the end of the biennium. And we at Habitat Portland region are in the pickle of our, pro you know, our project was actually too ready. We actually began some of the eligible work before the governor signed the bill. Um, and because of the confusion around whether it's a city project or a nonprofit project and the issues around prevailing wage and public procurement processes, we still don't have a grant agreement. So our window of, of using the money is shrinking. Um, and the uses in the bill are very specific. So it kind of like all of those factors kind of, you know, the the reimbursement model, the tight timeline for general fund spending, the specificity of the allocations, um, those all add up to like a pretty, um, like you, you really are in this pretty magic window of like having your project ready enough to, um, to spend the monies before the spend the money before the end of the biennium, but you know still have um, the flexibility to tailor the 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 timing and the procurement process and um, all of that to um, to meet the criteria of, of of the bill and then of Business Oregon. So I know that really feels like it's getting into the weeds, but it does impact the ability to get these dollars out the door. Thanks, Sarah. That that's um that's something also that that your colleague Shannon has raised in, in our QA list as well. So I appreciate you bringing that forward. Um to be clear, the the work that's directed to DLCD in this instance will not necessarily direct or identify a set of types of projects that are eligible for consideration, but rather the characteristics of projects that legislators might consider. Um, we do know, or we and, and staff has has certainly worked with um, worked with folks who were part of the last round of infrastructure funding in the twenty four session, and there have been many comments made about the narrowness of the ask. Uh, that legislators put forward, that they were water-specific projects, among other characteristics. In this case, we're, um, we're tasked with building the beginning of, of a set of, set of screening tools or a, a framework that as projects come in or as legislators determine what their intended outcomes are for the, fi the, the financial components of the next session, um, they'll be able to pick and choose and use some of what we share with them as the starting line or the starting point for being able to evaluate projects and rather than um, prescribing what projects, uh, what type of projects might be of, of interest or issue to the, the legislators in this session, just to be a, a little bit more clear in that, that sense. Um, I'll, I'll also make the point that um, 
that some of the considerations will hopefully be fairly general in nature so that this framework could be iterated and built upon in future sessions, that this may be a very early draft given our very short timeline and, and ability to um, put something cohesive together in such a short amount of time with limited resources. However, we hope that this will begin to provide structure so that um, it doesn't require too much magic in order to have a project set up appropriately for uh, the opportunity to, to be considered by the legislature. I hope that at least provides a little bit more clarity to what our task is at hand and how, how it might support a project like yours or a project like yours in the future. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. I think just, you know, as much breadth and flexibility um, as we can have um, will just make it easier to actually use the funds. I would say, Sarah, I think it would be interesting to follow up and have a, a conversation with you just to get a little more context. I mean, Maddie's right. We're not trying to redesign the process of how the legislature uh, provides them um, the funding and, and the grant agreements and the way um, the funding has to go through various checks and balances. We're just more, as she said, developing a screening tool. But I do think you're making some good points that would be context. And, and I'd just like to also fact check with you because I have heard from Business Oregon that they've been able to go back to the legislature in some cases and get um, continued um, approval for project money that wasn't spent within the biennium. So um, if if you if you are available, we'd love to circle back with you on that. But but thanks for your comments. For sure, thank you. All right, we'll go to Brock. You had a question in the in the chat. Maybe you'd like to come off mute and share um, your question here. If not, I'm happy to read it. Um, we'll stage. Oh, there you are. Oh, hi. Um, so I was wondering, are the, the the way you're currently thinking about it, is stage one kind of like project qualifications? Like you get, you know, let's say there's 100 projects, right? 85 of them meet the stage one qualifications. And then does it go to stage two for a tiebreaker? Or is this like one long evaluation and just like the points in the matrix are higher for the stage one considerations? Well, first, Brock, um, just to be a little bit more clear, there are not scoring points assigned to any of the criteria that we're recommending or suggesting to the legislature. Mm -hmm. uh, they've asked us simply to enumerate or alliterate what the criteria might be or considerations might be for a review of a project in terms of its likelihood of success or, or viability. And then secondly, to what, what would be, what would be criteria that that are likely to produce outcomes. And, and those outcomes in this context are housing options. Um, stage one is intended to be a, a clearinghouse or a, a, a stage that helps us determine whether or not a project has enough momentum or enough information available to move forward. Um, what we know is that like there are, there are a variety of projects that are suggested to the legislature at many different stages in their conceptual development. Um, as a DLCD is a planning agency, and so we like to hear that the projects being put forward are projects that are on cities' infrastructure, um, public facilities planning documents, or or elements like that, for example, that have been considered and and design to, to some extent conceptually designed. Um, there are certainly projects that could be considered that, that are not in those lists, but that's a, a great starting point as an example of a qualification of, of stage one qualification or consideration. Um, the legislature obviously can choose what it will uh, if, if a project's not on those lists, but that's a way to, uh, that's just speaking to one example of a way that a project might uh, could be considered uh, in stage one. Stage two in that same scenario or example might be that that project has uh, some particular impact or intended outcomes that can be shown 
either through some of the work that a city does around its housing analysis um, related to housing production or something similar to that that achieves other policy goals through other avenues. Um, so it's not necessarily a point system by any stretch at this point, but simply a set of things that might con be considered by legislators if and when they want to consider the viability of a project and likelihood of it moving forward in an immediate timeline. And then secondly, whether or not it needs a set of policy objectives and goals uh, related to outcomes. Okay, got it, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I might just uh, elaborate on what Maddie is saying. I think we really see stage one as within the time frame that we have something that we can deliver to the legislature where the framework, the matrix, um, whatever this ends up being will be um, something that communities can certainly submit information, doesn't require a lot of exotic analysis or, or anything, but is a fairly well-built model. Um, that way we can really separate the projects that are ready from those that are not quite ready. Stage two, to Maddie's point, we won't have a scoring system. We won't be talking about that. I think what we'll probably end up doing, given the time we have, is making a set of recommendations or uh, suggestions to the legislature about how they might look at priority, prioritizing projects, things to consider as it were, you know, it, absolutely how the project um, meets um, our housing production needs, but maybe ways in which they could uh, evaluate whether, yeah, this is a project that will absolutely further our um, housing, um, housing goals. Um, it's really ultimately a legislative call about what projects they want to prioritize, and, and we're trying to be very careful not to steer into that lane, but I think we will make some suggestions to them about how the legislature could take on that prioritization task in, in stage two. hope that helps. Yes, thank you. We'll go to Ariel. Hi, this is Ariel from City of Hillsboro. Um, I have a couple of questions on your process, and I apologize, I switched um, from car to my computer and like lost most of the Q and A. Um, so if this, this might be a repeat and I apologize, but one um, question is you mentioned a draft report. Is there gonna be an opportunity for folks to provide comment to then be reflected in a final report? Cause that seemed like a pretty tight timeline in December. I know you guys don't have a ton of time to work with, but what is, could you go over again what that opportunity looks like? Yeah, Ariel, yes. Um, we are expecting to have a draft framework out. So this will be the model on this, to Brock's earlier question, really focused on stage one, which is the screening tool, the evaluation, whether projects are ready or not, um, with some considerations for stage two, how the legislature might prioritize, prioritize project. That'll be ready in October, probably towards late October. And then we'll have a public comment period, um, you know, of two, three weeks uh, at, at least. So folks can um, review that, ask us questions and give us feedback about how that project works. One thing that I did uh, neglect to mention earlier in the slide about um, the process is while that public comment period is open and um, you know everyone has an opportunity to provide us comments about it, we will also be working with a group of practitioners um, and by practitioners, I mean uh, city community development directors, city public works officials, um, city engineers, uh, county officials with you know similar roles and responsibilities at the local level, and asking them the question of uh, this framework that we just came up with, is this something that you see you could submit a direct appropriation request to the legislature? And if you were to do it, can you answer the questions that are in the framework here. Can you pr provide the information that the framework, the matrix is asking? We wanna basically use that group at, uh, to peer review the model as it were, and tell us, is this workable? Um, have we set the bar too high? Have we set it too low? Um, again, is this information that communities can provide and will it tell us you know, with some confidence that yeah, the project is viable, feasible, it'll be, ready within a certain period of time and it's likely to achieve those outcomes particularly the housing outcomes so we'll that'll be another opportunity for us to get feedback on the draft framework but yeah in to recap there'll be a general open public comment period um, we'll have this peer review uh, process as well 
So hopefully that answers your questions. Thank you. Yeah, I had a couple more. Um, are you looking at other states' examples or programs if they're how they're kind of prioritizing just general infrastructure allocations, and then you know if, if any are tying it to housing and how, and then kind of semi-related, are you considering um, when you're making these recommendations considering the other infrastructure resources that are out there, whether they're like federal programs like the WIFI loan or others, to ensure that if the legislature is going to be prioritizing certain um, characteristics or certain readiness factors, how does that align with other funding that um, jurisdictions may be layering um, and make sure it doesn't conflict that kind of a thing? Yeah, great, great questions. And, and Maddie may have some thoughts too. So yes, we are looking to um, look for other models. Um, there are some models here within this uh, state of Oregon where, you know, similar uh, well, I'd say infrastructure projects, I should be very careful and not emphasizing too similar, but where infrastructure projects have been evaluated um, and screened, and then of course, ultimately prioritized. Again, I just wanna mention, we'll probably have suggestions around prioritization, but that's not gonna be um, a major focus of this project. I think given the timeline, we'll be focused more on the evaluation, the stage one, as Maddie described it. And more like um, evaluation factors, sorry, in terms of- Yeah, okay. So right, we, so yes. So along those, that vein, yeah, we are looking at um, models here within Oregon, both at the state level and at the local level for doing that. Um, yes, some uh, will have at least a limited look at some options from, from out of state um, where this has uh, been done. Thanks. And just sorry, one last thing uh, related to Sarah's comments earlier. Um, my understanding, and I don't mean to speak out of school, but my understanding is Business Oregon is going to be having some kind of technical LC to make some potential adjustments to those um, 1537 or not, whatever the bill number was, sorry. Yeah, 1530. 1530, so, thank you. Yeah. Um, where there were some some discrepancies between the explicit language in the bill and, and what the projects actually are. So I would just encourage folks to whoever your contact is that you're working with on your project at Business Oregon to to work with them and see if if those can, your changes are, that are needed are on the list or not. Um, there might be that opportunity. Yeah, we're working closely. Thank you, Ariel. We're working closely with Business Oregon and, and the folks who are directly involved in um, the infrastructure discussion for 2025 session, as well as implementation of, of Senate Bill 1530 from this last session. Doug, you had a comment you'd like to make? Yeah, uh, I just uh, make a comment that uh, at least one project, but I think several projects that the legislature specifically included in Senate Bill 1530 have run into uh, a question of the definition uh, according to the business organ uh, folks. And, and in those cases, projects that the legislature specifically allocated in the bill are not going to be funded unless the legislature comes back in 2025 and makes a technical change. And I, I think that's really, um, you know, illustrative of the problem that we face in Oregon, the default is let's make it more difficult for cities to get money for infrastructure instead of, you know, easier. Obviously, the legislature specifically put those projects in the bill, intended them to be funded. Uh, so there there should be some way to work it out. So, I, you know, Palmer, I agree with you that, you know, ultimately it is a legislative call, but then the agencies need to remember it's a legislative call. And if the legislature specifically allocates money for a project, they intended it to be funded, not intended it to have to wait and come back for a second legislative session to confirm what was obvious in the first place. So not really a question, more of an editorial comment, but in general, I think we needed to really make it easier for funds to be allocated. We're talking about timelines here. I was just reading an article about middle housing and the, and the cost of middle housing going up even under 2001, um, you know, and not being affordable anymore. Uh, so infrastructure is a key part of this. And, and if we wait another year and we have more construction inflation, that adds to the cost of the housing. So as I said in my comment, it you know the default ought to be yes rather than the default being no. So just more of an editorial comment than a question. But And I, I do appreciate what you're doing here. Don't get me wrong. So thanks. Um, and there's, there's actually, I wanted to just be a little bit, provide a little bit of clarification because we had a question about 
who's able to to for the opportunity to submit developments for consideration and again the the work that we're doing is meant to be a framework for folks especially the for the legislature and the support staff at the legislative financial office among others who support the legislature to utilize um dlcd department of land conservation and development has has been identified and directed as a as a convener of this process and, and for better or worse we we have very little um involvement in who submits a project and how it's processed um, for consideration by the legislature. However, uh, the hope is, is that we compile um, the right criteria and the right considerations for folks to uh, to find success in, in moving projects, especially those projects that have um, positive production opportunities for, for needed housing units. And I I'll use that term needed housing units as a term of art coming out of House Bill 2001 and some of the rulemaking that that DLCD is involved in right now um, around how communities are able to uh, produce those housing units with the help of legislative appropriations if if desired. Tracy, you have a question. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Hey, this is Tracy Rainey with Clean Water Services, and um, I know, Palmer, we've touched base with you a little bit on this, but I'm curious um, how you're going to be approaching through this process the differing um, the different agencies that deliver on infrastructure. So earlier you mentioned city, reaching out to city officials, county, um, but obviously we've got some pretty, um, we've got a good number of and some pretty large providers of infrastructure via special districts. Um, and one of the challenges that special districts will face is that we may not be able to meet the same criteria that a city could meet in terms of looking at number of units or um, number of affordable units associated with the infrastructure we're delivering, um, just because we don't control that aspect. Um, as easily as a city would in their discussions with a developer. We can certainly try and coordinate in that process, but I'm just kind of curious if um, there'll be some separate considerations based on the who is delivering the infrastructure or if you've thought about that. Great question, Tracy. And in fact, um, right now, DLCD in, in our rulemaking, we're working with your colleague, Cassara Phipps, um, on our capacity and urbanization technical advisory committee, um, which is uh, bringing a great light of special districts to our to our conversations around who delivers the project and how much how much do they have in terms of information to be able to to show that this in fact will will produce units among other things to speak to your question. Um, one one piece of uh, you alluded to it, and I think it's it's something to emphasize is that the considerations that we compile might provide topically some over some some overarching considerations. So if a project is viable or ready, your organization, a special district who delivers the project, will be able to de determine that or speak to that. What you may not be able to speak to are those stage two considerations of how much will it produce or what will its impacts be. And those that's where, one, we're, we're unlikely to provide as much refinement in this iteration of the, the infrastructure considerations. And then secondly, there is quite an opportunity for special districts who, who deliver the, the facility themselves um, to partner with their their municipalities or whomever they're serving um, to il illustrate some of those cr criteria or some of those considerations that might be of interest or or highlight those um, in specific ways. I guess in the absence of our specificity around stage two work at this state at this point, there might be a great opportunity for projects to speak to that in in a more general and narrative fashion. Um, in the future, there might be more refinement made to our our considerations matrix that help quantify that or provide more um, comparable criteria that projects might be able to to speak to more specifically and directly. So at this point, I think the 
<clears throat> the opportunity is still quite open um, for special districts to be able to speak to those stage one criteria. Um, and hopefully we are able to get your, your support and input on how those stage one criteria are, are structured and, and alliterated so that they, it, it's accurate enough that a special district might be able to provide them. Our yeah, hope is... Our hope is that the 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 things we're asking for are things that that um, providers or jurisdictions and and others who might be applicants are likely to have on hand, and we're not asking for novel information that needs to be generated in order to make the, an application or an ask. Yeah, I that's might good. add. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I might add to Tracy. That's a great question. When um, we do, I think we're learning more and more about the need to, in that stage one that Maddie refers to, that in that screening tool, evaluation tool, to ask questions around, you know, particularly if the project's of a larger scale. And let's say, for instance, we're talking about a direct appropriation that is a submittal by a local government. Um, you know, ha has the local government in thinking about this project, uh, particularly if they've paired it with a developer or a nonprofit that's providing housing, what, what what role, if any, do other infrastructure providers play in providing that infrastructure or supporting that project? That there is, I think, a need to ask questions around: Have we thought about intergovernmental coordination? Um, you know, particularly if we're talking about larger projects, or maybe it's not even just you know the larger project, but it's the area that's being served, um, and you have some overlapping jurisdiction and things like that. So. I just want you to hear, yes, we are thinking about not only the role of uh, special districts and being infrastructure providers, but how projects uh, might touch upon the need for intergovernmental coordination and making sure that we understood that element, um, it, you know, if, if it's warranted in a particular situation. And we've got um, one more question from maybe Peggy, if you'd like to come off mute and ask your question. I know you had one a little earlier, but perhaps there that's been answered. Um, maybe you have a question about stage two uh, considerations, and then we'll move into wrapping up after. Oh, thank you, Maddie. Uh, so what I asked about, it, it, first of all, I'm supporting the concept of making sure that that the issues that are raised today are in your report, not the answers, I get that part, but that the issues are in the report so that uh, legislators can understand uh, what the various providers are seeing and the concerns that they have about the final outcome of actually getting infrastructure and housing on the ground. What I did mention related to stage two was that you mentioned environmental protections, but there are also sometimes environmental benefits and that could, re that could reduce the cost of certain infrastructure. So at your stage two level, at least, if not even stage one, I would hope that that would be another one of the criteria considerations uh, as to which projects to fund. Thanks and appreciate today. Yeah, thank you. Peggy, that's that's a great point. That is something that we've heard quite a bit about. Um, uh, another way in the environmental world where that kind of um, plays out is, uh, like you say, not just the benefits, but it may be also that uh, a community has a particular piece of infrastructure that has been out of compliance for a certain period of time or is struggling to be in compliance because it's so antiquated or um, it's undersized relative to the demands uh, placed on that infrastructure. So that could be another priority if the legislature is so inclined to um, fund those type of projects, um, you know, moving projects out of you know, consent orders and into uh, compliance. Um, and so that that's the type of thing that uh, we've heard quite a bit about. And I'll leap in really quickly and say, because I know you want to finish up. Um, I heard the general fund discussion related to 1537 and even 1530, but one would assume that this criteria that you help to set up will also be helpful for bonding projects uh, funding. So I wanna make sure that we're not limiting this conversation because there's not gonna be a lot of general fund uh, to be able to do projects. 
but there might be the opportunity for more bonding opportunities, even though it takes a little bit longer. But you're already saying three to five years, which for those of us who want housing now, that's a big gulp. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think we will have to be agnostic about the funding source. Um, that's really a legislative call. Um, and I think you're right, Peggy, all indications are that the general fund will be more constrained than it has been in the last couple biennium. But we'll be pretty agnostic on that. I think we do want to highlight, um, this is taking up your, your suggestion of making sure issues are um, detailed or described in the report so the legislature can consider them. I do think we do want to highlight some considerations. So like, for instance, around bonding, if the project uh, is a bonded project and the proceeds from the bonds are spent within three years, well, then that bond can qualify as a tax exempt bond, which lowers the interest rates and, and makes financing the project less costly. So those are things we do want to highlight uh, in the report, but it won't be our role to say, well, that's the preferred way to pay for projects, bonding versus general fund, but we will try to, to daylight some things, some considerations uh, for the legislature. Perfect, thank you all. Thank you, Palmer. Thanks, Peg. Thanks for everyone's questions this, this morning. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Just a couple wrap up items. Uh, you'll receive a follow up email based on uh, the folks, especially the folks who registered for this, this webinar. Um, if you watch this webinar after the fact, please don't hesitate to email uh, Palmer, Mason, or I um, at dlcd.oregon.gov. Um, the registration list will be used as a public notice opportunity um, to send out when we when we do put out a publicly available draft for your consideration. And you're welcome to provide uh, comments when that that time is available in mid November. Um, again, there'll be a, a in that same follow up email to this this webinar. You'll also be directed to an opportunity to, to put your contact information to be made available for uh, our folks, our team to contact you related to focus group opportunities as we have capacity and availability to do so. Um, so please, if you are interested, please share your contact information just to be sure we're not um, contacting folks that aren't interested in providing um, contributions to those focus groups. And then finally, uh, we just wanna say, a huge thank you to those of you who tuned in this morning and who are watching this um, after the fact. This is a, a fairly large undertaking to convene a lot of different interests in, in, um, in a very short amount of time. Um, so please forgive our uh, our unpolished approach to how we're, <laughs> how we're performing the, the work. Um, if, if there are ways that we can improve uh, the delivery and and opportunity to engage you, please don't hesitate to share those with us. Uh, but generally speaking, we hope to be able to deliver uh, a set of considerations for infrastructure projects to the legislature in December of this year. Um, and we hope that that helps refine the process that we're able to, to support of our legislators making direct appropriations for infrastructure investments. Um, how do we help decision makers have the information they need to make good decisions uh, to support, in this context, housing production in Oregon. So thank you for your time this morning, and we look forward to your engagement and continued participation. Thank you.